yeah so it's um, working um, so today we are going to start looking at this uh, little animal called the uh, SPSS which we are going to use um, throughout the semester as our sort of uh, working tool for statistics and um, I'm not going to keep on very long for today because uh, it's very most important that you you start for yourself and uh, get into this but I will at least uh, get you going on the most basic things here um, so I just wanted to keep this picture here because this is maybe what you're gonna see when you start SPSS for the first time and this is something that is not commented in the compendium because it's something in the new version so here it says something about Unicode. It's just a way of coding uh, uh, text strings. It's we don't have to bother what it is at all, but you just say yes to that. So you click here, use Unicode encoding, and then it's going to do that for the rest of the time, I think. Um, then you get to this um, dialogue here, which sort of t asks you what you want to do. And probably you're going to be annoyed by this fairly quickly. So you're going to choose down here, don't show this dialogue in the future. So when you start SPSS, it will just start and don't try to be smarter than, uh, than you in a way. So and this is commented in the in the compendium somewhere so sometimes you want to just mark this and then SPSS from that point will start in a normal fashion so I'm gonna do that right away and say okay and then I might just open some files so we are some have something to work on here And I'm just going to do some examples. I'm going to use this file that we have seen with the demographic data from some countries. OK. So we, well, OK. So here is where we actually start uh, today. Uh, you have seen that you have been assigned to groups for the lab sessions. On Fronter, there's a list. So we start with three groups, each having two hours of assistance. And then we'll see. I expect some of you will just find it very easy to work with SPSS on your own and don't really need to be there. And so we might just collapse into maybe two groups later on. Well, we start with three. Um, yeah, so let's just have a look at these things. So, yeah. Uh, this SPSS program, it has a long, long history, actually. I don't know exactly when it started, but it started in the Stone Age of computers as a just programming language, in a way. And now, of course, it's uh, more or less advanced and menu-controlled system with a lot of extensions and stuff but its abbreviation is for statistical package for the social sciences um, but well it's just a statistical package so whatever science you do you might use SPSS you don't have to stick to social science and there has been some back and forth with the uh, ownership and so on, but this, the good thing now is that IBM has bought the whole thing. Cost about one and a half billion dollars or something, but maybe it's worth it. And the recent, the current version that we are working on is number 22. So my compendium was written last year, then we had version 18 and I was praying that not too much had changed because that would be a nightmare for me and it seems 
very little has changed. They changed the color and stuff on some windows. Used to be red, now it's more like blue, but um, mostly it's gonna work out as described in the compendium. So there are three things that we are going to do with SPSS. We're going to do something called data management. And we are going to do, of course, descriptive statistics and then also statistical analysis. So among other things, SPSS can do this. And if you look at SPSS, it's now becoming sort of part of a huge software system that's doing all kinds of business analytics and what you call uh, business intelligence and stuff like that. But we are not at all going into that world in this course. We're going to keep to the sort of old fashioned good statistics and uh, stay there, I guess. So there's gonna be a lot of menus that we are never gonna open, I guess, in, in the program. So we'll have enough with the, the ones that we're going to use. Okay, so technical issues with our use of SPSS. It's um, somehow installed on, on the computers located on this campus. And you are not going to have an installation on your private PCs unless you buy it for yourself, which you probably don't want to do. You might find on the web, I don't know exactly, there might be student versions that you can have on your PCs that would work okay, but they might have limitations on the sizes of data sets you can work on. Um, however, this is not going to be a problem at all because you can run on the campus computers with this remote desktop uh, thing. So all you need is a fairly uh, okay web connection where you stay. And it's even better now than what I thought because you're here in, um, say you're on a weekend in Oslo. And the thing you want to really want to do there is, of course, work with SPSS. Uh, so you sit with your PC here, and you go on the web. This is your PC. You go on the web to Molde. To Himolde, and you connect to a remote the server or something. I don't know the technicalities in this, but what happens is you're going to go and run on some computer here. So, okay. And then you have your So you're logging in as yourself as you're with your student uh, name and password and so on. So you get to see your files that you have on the campus system. And at least last year I thought it was like this. It may have not been true, but I thought that these were all that you could work on using this remote connection. But it now seems that you can actually, before you log on here, you can tell this system to add, for instance, some disks from your uh, local PC. So if you have your SPSS <coughs> data here, you may not have SPSS installed on your computer here, but you can run SPSS through here somehow. SPSS will run over here, but might use your data that you have here. And you can exchange this in some nice ways. So what I wrote in the notes that you got on front there was you will only be able to work on data on the campus file system. So the campus file, this is campus. This is the campus file system. But I think now that you can even switch back and forth between your local PC and the system here and do every kind of data acrobatics like this. 
Um, so I think that's the way it works now. And I, I posted a sort of guide to this on the Frontier just an hour ago. Um, so anyway, if it was true that uh, what I said last year, then it wouldn't be a great crisis because you can just go here. You can go start a web browser over here. You can go on the web and download from Frontier. those data that you need for this course at least, and put it on your file system, even if you're in Oslo. So you will have access to the files, but you have to keep them here in the worst case. But in the best case, even that doesn't matter. So there may be good news here. Yeah, so what I said now is actually what it says here. So just for those of you who may not be familiar with the remote desktop, desktop uh, let's have a just quick look. <coughs> so I am now working on this PC that sits over there. And this has some number at least. And here on the menu here. Sometimes you have to look a little bit closer into maybe all programs, accessories, and find the remote desktop connection there. You start it. And then, now, if you just connect here now, you will, well, when you do this, it will look a little bit different because the name of the server will be what is written in the compendium. This is for employees, and the students have a different server, but it's the name that's in the compendium, CARP or something. And if you just log on here, you will be in the situation where you don't see your local disks. So you can get into the some computer on the campus, and you'll see your local or your campus file system. So the little addition that we do is down here. Um, show options, local resources, and more. It's described in this document on the front there. I wrote a news message about it, so you find it there. And you can here choose to actually add some of the disks that I have access to on this computer. Well, here is a little bit compl complicated because some of the disks here are already my network disk, so I wouldn't want to connect this one, for instance. Because, yeah. But this is the, the C drive. This is the sort of main disk drive on a Windows PC. So inside here, there's a storage unit with some things on it, and that's the C drive. So that sits physically inside this machine. The rest of these things are complicated in the network and stuff. But the C drive is on that machine. So I'm, I'm choosing that one. I say OK, and connect. And then you just log in as ordinary. And it connects. And you can sit in Oslo, and you will have this picture, which is now the <coughs> interface. Or the so now this screen is just showing what happens on a different PC somewhere in this system. So here we have, let's see what's here. Yeah. So here it says a local disk that is C. Now the C drive here is actually the C on whatever machine I'm on remotely. <coughs> and then there's a C down here, C on SPC A134. So A134 is this room. Now this is the drive on that computer. 
So I can now play with files on either that physical thing there or anything else that is here. So you see, I, I recognize some of the other things that I already had from before. So this is going to look a little bit different from outside, but it's going to work fine. And now you will see, I can now start, whether I'm in Oslo or wherever, I can just start SPSS here. It will run on the computer here, but it will send every information through this window here. And I, I don't want to do that now because it's going to be complicated uh, stuff. And this is not only SPSS. Any, anything that's installed on the, the campus computers are available via this desktop. Uh, so this is nothing, I mean, this has a general purpose. It's not for just for SPSS. So it's just one option. Okay, and then while you're on the remote desktop here, it might be a little bit slow and so on, getting the information back and forth. And maybe you want to go on the web and see a movie in a break or something, then you might just switch to your local computer and then you, you don't have to break the connection. So you just, here you see the name of the server, so I just minimize this one and then I'm back running on this guy. So if I want to do something time consuming on the web, I would rather go directly from this one. And then I have my remote machine yeah. down here, so I can take it up any time I like. And switch back and forth like this. Yeah. So this is very nice. You can just, if you want to have a half an hour at home, you want to do a little bit of schoolwork or something. You can just log in and you don't have to take the bus up here or anything like that. Um, yeah, I think Yeah. So I think I'm going to shut down this connection. I don't think I need it anymore. So if I close this one now, it will just <coughs> warn me that this session will be disconnected. So I'll do that, and now I'm out of out of the system here. Um, yep, and we were in the middle of our lecture, if I remember. So, yeah, here is this Unicode thing that we saw in the beginning. Um, and then. Yeah, there might be some talk about the official sample file. So this SPSS system, it comes also with a lot of example data files. And they are on the C drive. Again, probably they will be in the program files slash or Windows backslash. IBM something folder. So let's just try to locate it. There's a lot of sort technical things that we just have to go through a little bit before we start really with SPSS. But um, okay. So here is my personal file area. Um, make sure that if you have important work or uh, any work actually, you, you save it on your personal uh, file area. This is the physical drive on the computer there. And the difference, one difference between this is that this one is backed up more or less, I think once a day, every night actually. So. If you do changes here, it will be observed by the system and they will copy it in the night. So, um, if something happens, you, you sort of crash a program and you lose some work here, the only thing that you will lose is what you have done in that day. 
you won't lose two weeks of work, for instance, or a half a year or two years. So it's backed up very frequently, and you can recover at least a very recent version of your work. But this guy, I had some horrible experiences where it just died upon me a couple of years ago, and I realized I had done the horrible mistake to save important uh, program code, among other things there. And it was just lost forever. Could never be recovered. So work on your on this area. I'm not probably maybe you don't even have the access to write on this disk for all time. Okay, but we need to look in here because programs might be installed here. So here is the program <coughs> files folder on the C disk. You go in here and you find the IBM. SPSS, and then you are down statistics, yes, and version 22, <laughs> and so on. And somewhere here should be samples. And we have English language samples. And the SPSS data files, they are have a name, and then the suffix is dot sub. SAV. I don't know what it's abbreviating, but it's what it is. So, um, if you double, if you just click on any of these, it will open in SPSS. And if your SPSS is not started, it will actually start SPSS and open the file. So, they are in here on the C drive. I have my own sample file here, and I don't want to open any more files for the moment. Um, yeah. OK. Just ask if you have any questions. Um, So this is a data file. You have seen a few of them. Um, so what the data file does actually or contains is we talk about objects, or we talk about cases. So always a data file will be a set of or one or several variables that will contain information about the objects, right? So in the sample file here, you will see that the objects are countries. And in this, ca this case, it's a selection of, of the countries of the world. And then we have variables. We talked about this before also. Variables. And the variables are whatever we want to register about these objects. So as I say, in this world 95 data, objects are countries, and the variables are uh, various demographic measures in this case. But of course, any data file, the object can be whatever. It can be people, it can be cars, it can be yeah, whatever. And it's very important to just get used to and realize that objects are always <coughs> representing rows in the data file. So here are sort of 
object. They can have a number, for instance, could be the first variable, one, two, three, four, five, down to some n. And this object tree, here we may have different variables that we record for this object. So it's 7 and 2.2, for instance. So that's the sort of fundamental structure in this, maybe, yeah. Maybe we could just connect this picture to the more theoretical picture that we had in the last lecture on Thursday, where we had what we call <coughs> a population. And we were talking about parameters of this population, which we realized was actually parameters of probability distributions or random variables. So one parameter of this population could be the expected value of some variable here. So I call this mu x. Um, say this is the mean uh, oh. <laughs> I'm going into some trouble with the terminology if I use this world 95 data because there's a variable called population okay uh, so this has nothing to do with the population word that I use here. okay mean Mean, mean density of population. Okay. Um, we said that we usually don't observe the whole population, but we usually observe some sample. And then we observe x1, x2. And so we pick out some objects from this population and record specifically the values of this x variable. Um, this would then correspond to one such column in the data set. Right. But so in this picture, we can have several variables at one time. That so we think of a population of objects but there can be many variables they can be y they can be set and so on so we can have simultaneously using the same sample also have observations on y y2 yn and so on and that would then be a different um, column in the data set And we were talking about last week, I'm just going to shoot a little bit ahead now and then I'll go back to today's topic. We're talking about estimating mu x with x bar and then Maybe we want a confidence interval, so we want the margins of error at 95%. So let me just briefly show you how this theoretical uh, exercise is done in SPSS. Um, so I'm talking about the density here. I have a sample of countries and the density for that sample is registered here. So what is the sample mean here and how can I get, for instance, a uh, confidence interval? So this can be done in several ways, but the most um, knock on is to use something called explore here, I guess. So I just take, in this case, the
density variable. It's here given by its label somehow. Um, and here I can say I want a 95% or I can have a 99% whatever confidence interval for the mean. Let's go with 95. We'll continue. Uh, and there pops up some output from this uh, process. And I see that the, the sample mean is 203.4 persons per square kilometer. Um, and uh, 95 percent confidence interval has a lower bound and an upper bound at 75 and 331. So this hopefully connects a little bit the theory that we did last week, where we just were given some x bar and some s and some n. And then we computed x bar plus minus set alpha half times S over square root of n something. We can do that, of course, but we can also use, if we work on SPSS, we'll do it maybe this way. <coughs> yeah. Okay, next week we will do this properly. So this week we are not going to do much of this. You, you can do it if you like, but it's not a core topic for this week. So my purpose here was more or less just to try to put into your minds that this picture of a data file has very much to do with this picture of a sample here and what we do with x1, x2, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, we said all this, I think. Yeah. OK. Um, yeah. So th there are two main windows in the SPSS uh, world. It's. Um, this one, which uh, shows you the data, and it's this one, which is a different type, where all the output comes. So here it says um, statistic view, statistics viewer, IBM SPSS statistics viewer. So this will be a structured sort of list of all your produced output from your various analysis. And it has a kind of structure here that you can collapse things if you don't want to look at everything at once and so on. So you will get used to that. Um, and here is the other window. It's called the uh, data editor. So you have data and output. That's where things mainly happen. Uh, right. Yeah. And. I talked about um, data files. They have this extension .sav, while the output file has this uh, suffix. So it's sp. V, probably from SPSS viewer or something like that. And you can save files in this format, and then you can just open them again, and it will be right back where you stopped working. And that is, of course, very nice. Um, So if 
I go like uh, here, say this. So suppose I've been working for two hours on my assignment or your report for something, and you have this and that graphics and those analysis, and you want to put them into your report, but you desperately need to go and have dinner or go have sleep and work next day. Then you just somehow save as. And the suggested here is uh, this right format for, for output. So next time you start working, you can open the data and you can open this, this output and they will be just ready to continue. I don't want to do that now. And another thing, just mentioning it, you can have at the same time, you can have several data windows. You work on several data sets in, in uh, parallel. And you can also have several output windows. So that could be useful, for instance, if you don't know exactly what you're doing, which is quite uh, common in research. Um, you might have sort of a sketch on one side. And then if you come to something that you really want to keep, you put it in a different file, which is a more important uh, save file. So you go here on the file menu, you open new uh, output uh, here. And then they sit right here. And let's see. It's not so easy to see here. It's usually um, these windows usually sit. Yeah, you see it when they come up like this. So this has a blue cross on it. It means this is the now the active output window. So if and this is the active <coughs> data with the red cross here. So if I run an analysis on this one, the output will come here. And I change which is the active window with uh, some um, hocus pocus here. There's a button in the non-active windows, which is called Designate Window. So if you click there, it will become the active window. And of course, this is maybe not something you want to do this week uh, or even next week, but maybe it's good to know that this is a possibility. So we can just mm, yeah. I sort of wrote some examples that I could do here because I thought I would have extremely much time this today, but it seems um, as usual going much slower in my lecture than in my mind when I prepare. So yeah, let's see what we have time for towards the end. OK. Um, this is also, uh, well, when you start using SPSS, you will use, you will do everything by using these menus. So you choose among files, blah, 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 data, <coughs> and so on, menus. And then you get these dialog boxes. And you're probably most used to communicating with programs in that way. Okay. So if you want to do what I did here, compute the sample mean of something and give me a confidence interval. You go to the descriptive statistics menu and down there somewhere and do your choices. And here you click some, you choose a variable here and you click some options. And then ultimately you click some OK and then something happens. So this is how most of you will use SPSS throughout the course, I guess. 
Um, when you become a little bit more advanced, uh, as some of you might be, maybe in your writing your thesis and so on, your master thesis, you might want to use something called syntax files. So this is a third type of SPSS file, and it's called S. I think it's dot SPX. And what this is is this is actually down to the more old-fashioned code that was written for SPSS originally. So rather than clicking and doing stuff here, you could define data set this and that. Uh, variable is the density. And I want to compute mean and 95% confidence. And down, down, down. Now, why do you want to do that? Well, it may be ultimately that you you may do like 20 or 30 such operations, for instance, on some data. <coughs> and then next week, you get more data. And you want to do the same 30 operations. And for each operation, there will be 10 different clicks you need to do. But if you have this file, all of it is already written here. So there may be only a few places where you need to change something. Or maybe you don't even have to change anything. You just run this file on the data set. And it will produce maybe 20 pages of output. So for like more heavy work, you're going to want to do syntax files. And this is going to be a little bit easier than you think. Um, we're going to take a break just now. But um, this syntax kind of looks slightly horrible. But what you do when you, for instance, go to a menu and you fill in this dialog, then this is completely equivalent to some piece of program here. And it's actually quite easy to produce this program piece out of what you have done up here. So if you go like, uh, well, actually, as this is set up now, I think we even get the, yeah. Re really, wh what you're going to do is you're going to turn off this option. But the option that is active in SPSS as I run it now is to actually write out in the output window, the, S the syntax code for all of my operations. So here is the data set name, data set one. So it's what it calls this one. Examine variables, density, uh, statistics, descriptives, confidence interval 95, and so on. So this little piece of code is exactly what produces the output down here for me. Yeah. So let's not go into detail about that, but some of you at least will uh, realize that this is uh, very, very useful. Um, yeah. Maybe I can show you immediately how we turn this off because it's going to just confuse us at the moment. And this is described in the compendium also, how you shut out this option, I think. You go to Options. Um, this is about the viewer. And now it says down here, it's checked uh, display commands in the log. So the log is the whole list of output. And if you click here, yes then it will also put the syntax there. So I'm going to shut this off. And then we will only get the output and not this syntax. Right. So Yeah, 
so I mean, if you look at the compendium for chapter two, it's almost just a set of choose this menu, then you get this dialog, and it's described what you click to do whatever you want. Um, you usually want to do something about some variables. So you choose the variables from a list of all, then you click some buttons with options and stuff. You check some options. Yes, I want to have these graphics, or no, I don't want it, and so on. So this is going to be quite easy. And before taking a break, there's just one feature that I like to point to that is not so easy to remember, maybe, but it's very handy. It's called recall dialog. So very often you do something, you do an operation here, and then you realize, oh, no, I forgot to click the the one choice here that I wanted, or yeah, or I did something three steps back. Then I would like to have a different variable. So what? So you have this thing here, which just recalls what have you done recently. Okay. So if I go in here, I click the explore. I get my previous use of this menu filled in in the exactly the same way as it was. And if I want to change a little bit, then I can just do those few changes. So I can take this variable away and do another one, for instance. Yeah. So where did that output go? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's, it's right here because it's a different window. Yeah. Okay. So let's have 15 minutes. Have some air. <laughs> 